win Nikki Ackerman. Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Hey, everybody having a good day here? Hi, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. It's a good day. Hi, Sarah Lane. And it's Sarah Lane's just... awesome sci-fi hair. I like it. Oh, yeah. Mm, I know. Got a little bit of a haircut yesterday. Got them all cut, in fact. Uh, <laughs> some more than others. So, yeah. It's kind of... I, w- I would say it's a fun summer cut, but... I don't know. It'll be a fun winter cut. Whatever. Anyway, uh, the show is not actually about haircuts, uh, but it is about technology, and we're all here, so let's get into it. What do y'all say? Let's do it. I'm ready. Okay. Ah. I will will count myself in. In three, two, one. This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. That's you. Thanks to all of you, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, Rodrigo Smith Sabata, and new patrons, William and Victor. Welcome, William and Victor. On this episode of DTNS, Apple and Epic, still going at it. Raspberry Pi 5 is here, and Dr. Nikki is going to explain how lab embryos are more evolved than ever. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 28th, 2023. From Studio Cinnamon, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And from all the way down in South Alabama, I'm Dr. Nikki Ackermans. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, Before the show, we got word that CEO of Sony uh, Interactive Entertainment, Jim Ryan, announced he's retiring in March of next year after almost 30 years with the company. Hiroki Totoki, who is president and chief financial officer of parent Sony Group Corp, will become interim CEO of the games business once Ryan departs while they find a new CEO. All right, let's start with the quick hits. Yesterday, we passed along a report from the information that OpenAI CEO Sam Altman was working with former Apple designer Johnny Ive to build a hardware device. Today, the Financial Times sources say OpenAI is in advanced talks with Ive and SoftBank's Masayoshi Son to launch a consumer device described by some, as the iPhone of artificial intelligence. The hope, reportedly, is to create a more natural and intuitive user experience for interacting with AI. After nearly two years in beta, Photoshop, the web service, a simplified online version of the company's desktop photo editing app, is now available to all. Photoshop on the web offers commonly used tools like Generative Fill and Generative Expand, powered by Adobe's Firefly Generative AI model, but with a redesigned layout designed to give new users a more streamlined experience. Apple launched a new iPhone wallet beta feature for UK users, which lets them see their current account balance, recent deposits, and payments and balances after using Apple Pay. The new features use the UK's open banking API and follow Apple's acquisition of a company called Credit Kudo. That uses open banking to give users a snapshot of their financial health and credit score. Banks, including Barclays, HSBC, Lloyd's, RBS, Monzo, and Starlene are all on board, and this integration is rolling out first as part of the upcoming iOS 17.1 developer beta. OpenAI said in a post on X that it has expanded the data ChatGPT can access beyond its September 2021 cutoff and can now surf the web. In OpenAI's own words, browsing is available to Plus and Enterprise users today and will expand it to all users soon. To enable Choose Browse with Bing in the selector under GPT-4, this latest web browsing feature will let websites control how ChatGPT can interact with them. Disney Plus is now alerting Canadian subscribers that beginning November 1st, it's going to start restricting password sharing in Canada. The announcement came in an email sent to Canadian subscribers, but the company didn't elaborate how it in fact plans to enforce the policy. A new account sharing section in the Canadian subscriber agreement also notes that Disney may analyze the use of your account and that failing to comply with that agreement could lead to account restriction or termination. Those are the quick hits. All right. So Apple and Epic, they've been squabbling for several years now, and they just can't seem to get along. So here's the latest. 
Apple has asked the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, to review a judge's ruling from two years ago that deemed developers should be able to direct users to alternative payment method methods other than Apple's own app store. That's where Apple takes a 30% cut of all sales of digital goods and services. Now, Epic, maker of Fortnite, among other games, doesn't think it should pay that fee, was very vocal about that. That's what it is fighting with Apple over. This follows Wednesday's news of Epic initially also asking the same Supreme Court to weigh in on the ongoing dispute. Epic Games sued Apple back in 2020 after Apple kicked Epic out of the App Store for violating Apple's rules. Initial rulings and appeals on the suit have mostly favored Apple, but a federal judge did rule that Apple violated California's unfair competition law by restricting developers from telling consumers about alternative payment options. We're probably not going to know if the SCOTUS will select the case for a few months based on the SCOTUS's schedule. Yeah. Uh, yeah. SCOTUS has a schedule. Uh, Congress has a schedule. Uh, lots of uh, companies have schedules. I don't know, Rob, uh, Nikki, the, you know, this whole thing I thought was more or less put to rest. Um, obviously, Apple and Epic, uh, neither company feel that they fairly, you know, won the argument or this wouldn't be ongoing. Uh, you know, I, I've always sided with Epic and, and any other company uh, that says 30% is just too much. Uh, and, you know, we should not be forced to go through the Apple App Store for something that could, uh, you know, savings could be passed on to the consumer in another way. Um, but Apple has its reasons for doing it as well. So, yeah, what do we think? You know, I, I think that Epic, um, you know, I... I personally agree with why epic is doing this but you know as we as we said in the read they they basically have failed most often when when they go up against apple and, and it gets to court so I, i'm just kind of wondering at this point what what is epic's play are, are they hoping that public opinion ultimately is going to maybe sway what the court would say i don't know if that is a great strategy it's a strategy and we'll just have to see if the if the supreme court even picks this case up you know, in in perhaps related Epic News, CEO Tim Sweeney, uh, who has been very vocal about the Apple case, but also is representing Epic in general, also confirming reports that the company is laying off 830 employees, which is about 16 percent of its workforce. So not, you know, 50 percent, but still it's, you know, you're nearing a thousand employees. It's a lot of layoffs. Sweeney said Epic will divest from indie music storefront Bandcap, which Bandcamp rather, which Epic acquired last year uh so yeah that was a pretty recent acquisition it also plans to spin off super awesome uh super awesome makes safe online experiences for kids uh perhaps pretty candidly sweeney said epic is spending way more money than we earn and i wonder i don't think this is posturing i i think that epic needs to cut some costs many companies do and layoffs are a part of this but i wonder how much of this will be used as leverage uh, in this ongoing Apple case, uh, you know, by Epic saying, hey, you know, look at all these people that are out of work now. We, Apple forced our hand here. You know, I think Apple or I should say Epic, they they may try that. I really think what is happening here is that Epic, like a lot of companies, they overdid stuff during the pandemic when people had enormous amounts of free time and were paying playing ridiculous amounts of Fortnite and other Epic games. Now that we're kind of back to normal, um, you know, people's time is shifted elsewhere. Therefore, Epic's revenues are going down. So I think that it's probably as much about that is if, you know, if anything, mm -hmm. but if they think it'll work, hey, we have to lay these folks off because that 30 percent that, you know, we have to give to Apple every time somebody buys one of our apps or upgrades or does whatever. If they can use that, and they think it's going to help their case. I wouldn't put it past them trying it. A friend of mine who works sure in. It's just oh, go ahead, Nikki. Gonna... Sorry, I was just going to say, this is probably just going to keep dragging on forever. And the fact that there probably is going to be a government shutdown soon is going to make the, you know, the SCOTUS selection last even longer. So I don't think we'll Friend be knowing mine, the answer anytime soon. Yeah, I know. I, I, <laughs> I, think I, I think I agree with you there, Nikki. A friend of mine who works uh, not for Epic or Apple, um, but uh, works in the uh, mobile gaming uh, industry, I asked her, what do, you, what do you think about all this? And she said, you know, everyone keeps talking about Fortnite and how Fortnite is 
you know, this is such a big part of the whole thing because Fortnite is so big. She said, you know, Fortnite's kind of long in the tooth at this point. Uh, Epic yeah. had, you know, tried out another game that did okay, but isn't isn't the kind of hit uh, that Fortnite was. And I have really heard anyone else talk about that. I'm not a Fortnite player. So I, I, you know, I don't totally know how much that can be used as, you know, collateral in this situation. Uh, but it definitely seems to be brought up quite a bit. So let's talk about tiny little computers that don't cost a whole lot that are actually amazingly powerful for what you get. It's been about four long years since the release of the Raspberry Pi 4, and though there was some speculation that its successor wouldn't be available until later this year, if not next, the Raspberry Pi 5, along with its $60 starting price tag, is available for pre-order today and will be available for purchase by the end of next month. A lot of noticeable improvements made on this Raspberry Pi 5. I will talk specs now. Uh, it includes a 64-bit quad-core ARM Cortex A76 processor that runs at 2.4 gigahertz, allowing for a two to three times performance boost when compared to the Raspberry Pi 4. The device also comes with an 800 megahertz video core V2 graphics chip, two four-lane 1.5 gigabit per second MIP, MIPI transceivers that let you connect up to two cameras or displays, and a single-lane PCI Express 2.0 interface offering support for high bandwidth peripherals. But you'll still need a separate adapter, such as an M.2 hat, hat stands for hardware attached to top, for you to take advantage of that. The Raspberry Pi 5 also boasts dual 4K 60 HDMI outputs with support for HDR, a micro SD slot, two USB 3.0 ports, two USB 2.0 ports, gigabit Ethernet, a 5 volt DC power connection via USB C, and Bluetooth 5.0 with Bluetooth Low Energy. All right, Rob, I just, uh, just the other day, my Mac Mini that I use right now uh, when I'm streaming for a variety of things has started to wheeze a bit. It's been wheezing at me. Um, you know, restart has not helped. And I'm thinking, all right, what's the next step? Could something like the Raspberry Pi 5 be my streaming machine for $60? Um, it, it, it absolutely could be that that is a thing that a lot of people set them up. They set them up as media players. And the fact that this thing is now supporting H is, it's got HDR, you know, HDR support at 4k. Yeah, it, it, it could do it. So it, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see that actually running on, you know, powering someone's giant television or a monitor, but it could actually mm -hmm. do that. One of the things I, you know, I, I did own a Raspberry Pi. I believe it was like the, the second edition, probably, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And yeah. I just got it to tinker around with it and play with it. But a really cool thing that actually someone I know does is they build actual arcade games. They build the full cabinet. You know, they, they do work working. They've turned the garage into a wood shop. And they actually build the cabinets to hold, uh, you know, a Raspberry Pi a you know a, a monitor and then the keyboard control or I should say that you know the controllers uh, you know for the you know for for the games and then they load up literally hundreds if not thousands of games to that Raspberry Pi and play it and when and when you're you're down in the basement playing on these games it really feels like you're playing on an actual full arcade style game and like this person I know that they that they've done is they've turned this into a little bit of a side business you know during the summer months you know he's a school teacher teaches wood shop at school but you know during the summer months when he is off he builds probably 10 or 15 of these things and they sell anywhere from like 1500 to 3 grand depending on how good they look and all the stuff that they put in them so that's wow. one area where I know raspberry pis uh you know you know swim you know swimmingly well I should say they they are really good for emulating arcade games yeah, overall. Nikki, have you have you played around with a Raspberry Pi? You know, I've had my eye on one for a little bit just to try out one of those like I don't know what they call them. They like electronics maker sets to kind of learn how to do electronics. And mm -hmm. sixty bucks is not a lot, so this might be going on my Christmas list. Um, and I'm sure the uptick in specs is more a little bit more on the nerd side, but I mean, it looks like you can do a lot with this. So I might I might get one. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, a fun tinkering project. We could all have like a right. pie off. Like and Legos, see what but we come upgraded. up with. Yeah. And like I mean, these fun. things are ridiculously inexpensive for what you yeah. get now. Like I said, this this is not a you know you, you're not going to say I have a Mac you know Book Air. 
can I replace my MacBook Air with a <laughs> Raspberry Pi? Probably not. But for you know, you're, you're not going to be able to do that. But for just the power that you're getting in this device for 60 bucks or for for 80 bucks, if you were to go with the eight gigabyte version of it, it's 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 pretty amazing um, for for tinkerers, for folks who are just you know trying to learn more about computing, play around. Maybe you want to learn um, you know some alternate uh, you know you know programming languages, or just just really play around with something and tinker around and not worry about destroying your two thousand dollar laptop. Uh, this is really cool to play on. Well, if you have a thought of what we should all do with our upcoming Raspberry Pi 5s or anything that we talk about on the show or something that we might talk about on a future show, we would like you to tell us about that. And one way to do it is to email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. So earlier this month, scientists at the Wiseman Institute in Israel published research in the journal Nature reporting the creation of an early human embryo using only stem cells and without the aid of sperm, eggs, or a womb. The team took adult human stem cells collected from skin cells and cultured them in their lab. The model resembles an embryo at day 14. The team's next goal, because I know that's your question, is to achieve a model at 21 days of development with a 50% success rate and obviously go from there. Okay, so Nikki, let's break this down. What is an embryo model? How do they make it? And how long has this been going on? Yeah, we're going to go all over all of this. Um, so exciting find, and I'm excited to tell you guys about it. So Usually before these models, how embryology research would be done is that you would use donated embryos. Um, but in this case, this embryo is created in the lab from scratch from the stem cells that you mentioned. Um, and so the end goal for this is to kind of eliminate that sample scarcity that comes with using donor tissue. And it also maybe will help reduce some ethical limitations in the future. So when, uh, stem cells are um, retrieved from skin cells. What does that process look like? Um, well, they uh, basically you can culture these, you take these cells that are kind of like the origin cells of the skin cells. They're not completely skin cells yet. And then you can culture them and uh, inject certain factors in them so that they turn into different cell types. And actually this is not the first time that this type of embryo has been made. So, to give you guys a short timeline, the first model embryo was developed from stem cells only uh, in 2012, and this was in mice stem cells. So that obviously we always try everything first in mice. And then the first human oocyte, which is the egg cell, uh, which was made from stem cells, was in 2018. So they made the human uh, egg cell, and then the next logical step was to do this sort of embryo model. Now, you talked about ethical implications. Um, obviously, there's much more research to be done here, but it's a pretty important step. Why is this such a big deal going forward? That's a very good question. So um, the, the fact, the big deal is how this actually happens. So if you think about this starts out as a handful of pluripotent stem cells, meaning that these are stem cells that have the possibility to become any other kind of cell. They have that possibility within their uh, genes, let's say. And mm -hmm. these specific cells, what happens is they self-assemble into an embryo model. Um, and this happens for multiple days. In this case, the oldest they got to was 14 days. And at that point in time, uh, four different cell types had differentiated from these stem cells and they separated into different cellular layers and started to form the embryo, which obviously eventually becomes a human. And for me, a pretty cool part about this is that this developed in the lab in vitro exactly the same way that it would have normally developed in a human. Um, and that's pretty incredible. All that in a Petri dish or the equivalent. I mean, yeah, knowing quite a few friends at this point in my life who have gone through uh, IVF, um, in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. or gone a surrogate route uh, for you know their own ethical reasons, or perhaps medical reasons, or both. Um, I know that it is extremely expensive, um, and for someone's body, extremely taxing. Uh, yeah. Does this I, is the hope here that that we're going to bypass some of the the current uh, 
solutions that we have to, you know, <laughs> everything that, that goes beyond just how people make babies normally. Yeah. And, and like we mentioned in the beginning, this right now has a very low success rate. I think the success for this one is about 1% based on how mm. these cells work. Um, it's a really complicated recipe and their goal is to learn more about things like IVF and also things just about how embryos develop because one of the reasons we need IVF is because we have sometimes faulty embryos, but we don't really know why because they're hard to study. Um, and obviously this is an incredibly complicated process. I did break it down into like some, a small recipe. If you want to hear about how, what's the recipe to make. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Let's do Apparently, it. Apparently <laughs> you start with 120 <laughs> pluripotent stem cells from a human cell line, not a mouse cell line, and you let them grow for three days. This is like, put them in a pot and stir them for three days. Um, and you continue this culture in something that's called an orbital shaker. Literally, it's just shaking it around so that it doesn't get stuck to the bottom of the uh, Petri dish. And uh, you use a cell culture media. This is just a liquid that has all the things that you need for cells to grow. Uh, I'm going to call this the secret sauce for the embryo. Uh, at about day eight, you will get a spherical structure. So that's already getting kind of interesting. And it starts to have different tissue compartments that have self-organization. So this means the cells are differentiating into different tissue types. And by days 11 and 12, you will get these fully differentiated cells that form these different structures and they express growth factors that make the cells move and change shape into something called gastrulation. The easiest way that I have to explain this is like, if you think about a human as like a giant straw, <laughs> the empty part, the inside part of the straw, like your guts and all that, that's gastrulation is like when a sphere becomes kind of like a straw. <laughs> wow. That's how I explain that to my class at least. Um, and along this entire process, the researchers inspected all of these embryos microscopically and noted that all the molecular properties and the structural properties of these embryos match the human ones at these same, same stages. So this is a model for human embryo. They're not technically human embryos, but they look almost exactly the same. Is this a way, I mean, I know it's obviously a way to better understand how embryos grow. Um, and, and this is one step closer to that, uh, because as you said, sometimes it's not super clear why embryos fail. Is yeah. Is that the end goal? I mean, are we, you know, is the goal to, I mean, I'm talking super science fiction way down the road to not have people carrying children anymore, uh, you know, or, or some combination of the two? It, I think it's a tricky one. I think specifically the scientists in question don't mention this too much because that's a slippery slope to go down. Obviously, everyone's first thought is like clones and, and you know, Gattaca mm -hmm. style genetic manipulation of embryos. The main idea right now is to make it easier to study early stage embryogenesis and not having to use donor cells from people to do that. I think that's a really big goal already. Um, and then I think for them is to make it past, you know, 21 days, like you said, and then longer than that. And then ethics also become complicated, especially in places like the U.S. So I think it's going to be a lot more incremental steps. Um, what, what, I think the end goal will be helping people who would need help uh, creating embryos. Maybe that's mm -hmm. a good way to put that. And you, you had mentioned uh, before the show today, because I had said something about, oh, you know, IVF, so expensive. You know, so I hear, and you said, well, this is going to be expensive too. Is the idea that eventually, and obviously there's still a lot of work to be done, eventually this would be much more cost effective uh, than, than some of the alternative routes that science provides? Well, I would hope so, but the way it is now with a 1% success rate, it involves a lot of work in the lab. So obviously right now, I doubt it's very cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, they, maybe they could streamline it in the future, but we definitely have to wait and see whether that is more efficient. I would assume it's at least easier to create something than to get donor tissue to a certain extent. Whether this remains stable after 14 days is another thing that they still need to investigate. Well, Dr. Nikki, thanks so much for bringing this to our attention. I know a lot of people are probably hearing about this for the first time, myself included. Uh, really cool. Thank you. Yeah. On a very different note, uh, if you feel like traveling, which, by the way, Dr. Nikki also did uh, quite yeah. a bit of travel, um, and you're tired of those junk fees that get tacked on to your plane ticket or various other things that you have to buy when traveling, Chris Christensen has some tips for you. 
This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. This is not just a tech minute, but also a little bit of a legal one. There's been talk about junk fees in travel. President Biden has talked about that. There's things going through the U.S. Congress in terms of changing the rules. But California is likely to actually pass two laws before then, SB 478 and AB 537, that will do things like changing it so that sites like Airbnb would have to give you all of the fees except the taxes. So the taxes could be separately, but all of the cleaning fees that would apply, all of the other fees, so that when you look at the price, it's actually the price plus the taxes, which seems like they could have included that, but they did not. But it looks like some help may be coming for those of us who are tired of junk fees. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. All right, let's check out the mailbag. So on Tuesday's show, we asked uh, folks what they felt about the idea of foldable laptops now that we're starting to see more and more options. We've got a ton of feedback, uh, so we'll go through a couple. Josh Lama from Sydney, Australia wrote, I can see some positives in having a foldable laptop for the use of web development, IT administrative jobs, where a vertical screen on the go might be preferred over a horizontal one. Making the keyboard and mouse external could give a lot of flexibility, but then you're carrying around extra peripherals. The closest contender to a foldable laptop on the market today, says uh, Josh Lama, would be the attempts to sell that a uh, mobile OS can do everything that a desktop OS can do, like the Samsung DX, which turns your phone into a Chromebook-esque virtual machine with a dock, or iPad OS in split view. But at this time, we haven't seen widespread attempts of that working. Developers have experimented to make the iPad Pro their main workstation, but they've run into issues with multitasking and working within that form factor. DX hasn't gotten a whole heap of attention since its launch back in 2017. There's just something about the laptop form factor that makes it work. That being said, I cannot justify the $4,000 asking price. Andrew from Melbourne, also in Australia, thanks to the Aussies today, uh, says, working in tech, I like using machines with large screen real estate while also being portable. If they have a high viewing position, that's even better. I currently use a GPT WinMax 2 with a portable 16-inch external monitor when I'm on the go. But having a foldable portable external monitor that could be powered and receive signal using USB-C displaying up to 30 inches would be ideal. It could fit in the backpack while folded. I'd have a beast that could be taken out when I need to do some real work or play a few games away from home. And Benjamin from Boone, Iowa wrote, I am a mechanical keyboard enthusiast. I would love a foldable laptop that I could use without a built-in keyboard and plug my mechanical keyboard in instead, provided there is more than one USB port. It would be a useful item. The price is way out of my price range right now, but it is a promising technology, and I may buy one when the prices come down in future years. Rob, I know you weren't with us on the show, but I'm going to guess that you have thoughts on the idea of a foldable laptop. We're obviously getting used to foldable phones. Um, so you know, I was, am d- a user of Samsung Dex. I use uh-huh. it fairly regularly, uh, you know, from my phone. So not at four grand, but if if there was a a, a nice portable folding, uh, you know, you know, device a folding, you know, a foldable laptop that I could, uh, you know, y- use with Dex. I do it. I, you know, I, I would try. I try to use it now with uh, like portable monitors and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it, it is something that I would at least, you know, give a shot to. I also, you know, um, I, I've got a, you know, a mechanical keyboard here as well. I am a, a huge fan of them. I like building them. And I have a laptop that basically is a desktop. But if if there was one that came that was just a giant monitor without the keyboard, I know I would have my you know, my, my mechanical keyboard plugged into it because I got my mechanical keyboard plugged into the one that has a perfectly fine keyboard on it as we speak. There you have it. Uh, Nikki, what are your thoughts? Foldable laptop, yeah or nay? I'm unsure because right now I'm, I'm talking from one of those laptops that has like the touch screen and the screen folds all the way around to the back. And I thought that was really cool when I bought it and I literally never ever used that feature. If anything, I accidentally like touch my screen and screw something up. So maybe could be a little bit of a, a, you know, like a fancy feature, but it seems like some people have specific use cases for it. I I kind of see what Rob's saying is like a modular piece that is kind of cool. Um, Yeah, I don't know if it'll be enough to be marketable to everyone. So it might just stay expensive. 
Well, when uh, when you're not using uh, your uh, laptop that does cool things uh, like turn itself on its head, uh, let folks know, Nikki, where they can keep up with all that you do. Yeah, of course. So it's easy. It's my name everywhere. It's uh, NicoleAckermans.com on my website, Nicole Ackermans at Blue Sky and Ackermans Nicole. I always want to call it Blue Ski, but it's Blue Sky. That's where the scientists are. Um, having their exodus right now from uh, Twitter slash X. Really? Blue Sky is kind of the scientist? That's the that's the social We're network that it. the scientists have, have chosen? Yeah, I think so. so- some of you anyway, your friends. <laughs> well, we're cool. so glad to have you uh, on the show today. Nikki was traveling recently, so we hope to see you early and often uh, after today. I hope so, too. So, folks, it's free preview week. All this week, we're giving everyone access to Good Day Internet Extended Show. Stick around for GDI as we discuss what your Zoom background or any video chat background, for that matter, says about you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't want to know. Uh, But uh, I do want all of you to know that you can catch the show live because we record it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. We're always on demand, but we'd love to have you join us live if you can. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Tristan Jutra joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Woohoo. Excellent show, everybody. Good show, folks. Good show. Good show. Good show. Good show. Good show. Uh, Rob, before you uh, tell us all what our Zoom backgrounds mean about us, just a reminder that if you want to uh, let your voice be heard about what we should title the show. Uh, that's DTNS and GDI. Um, and it is, uh, you know, you get GDI uh, for free this week. So maybe you're listening to GDI for the first time. Head on over to showbot.tv slash DTNS2. Make your voice heard. So researchers at Durham University in the UK released a study published in the Public Library of Science titled Virtual First Impressions, Zoom Backgrounds Affect Judgments of Trust and Competence. The study compared how 167 adults judge pictures of Zoom participants' faces against different backgrounds. Each image featured a man or a woman with a smiling or neutral expression. The backgrounds tested were blurred living space, house plants, a bookcase, an empty wall, and a novelty image of a walrus. The faces placed against the houseplant or bookcase background were judged the most competent and trustworthy, and faces over the novelty picture or living space were judged the least competent or trustworthy. The study also noted more research is necessary to confirm these findings and to see if they apply across cultural context. All the participant faces were of white individuals. No surprise Mm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know... If I'm the only one who follows Raid My Skype Room, this is a Twitter account or an X account. Um, This is, it's for all sorts of backgrounds, but this was a very popular account that was launched in the pandemic when all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, I get to see everybody's office or kitchen or wherever they might, you know, have like haphazardly set up uh, their you know, background. We're all pretty used to this doing remote uh, video work, but a lot of people were just doing this regularly for the first time um, and thinking about lighting and ring lights and, you know, all that good stuff. And I, I have to say, I, I'm so used to so many different kinds of backgrounds that I try not to let that hopefully influence my feeling about the person sitting in front of it. But there is something to it. There is definitely a, what does this say about you? The way that, I don't know, the car you drive or the shoes you wear might say the same. Yeah, my first thought was like, if I'm interviewing someone on Zoom and like they're in a basement and it's like dark and there's like, I don't know, I would be like, what are you doing? Yeah, or, or like, you don't do this very often, right? Yeah, that like kind this of is thing. not professional, but it depends on the context, like an interview versus like, you know, a, a podcast or something. It's not at all the same context, so. Totally, yeah. The I also think it was pretty cool. That's a good point. I like the walrus. <laughs> well, it, but it was like it was the if you see the photo, it's centered behind the yeah. person. You kind of want the you walrus. You do like to... I did, and I had a herd yeah. of sheep in my background in my zooms during the pandemic. There you go. The full All right. background. That's yeah. kind of fun. 
Yeah, I, I wonder if there's any variances of before pandemic and after pandemic. Because I would have to imagine that during the pandemic, people just got used to, you know, there may be a a loose child that runs through the background, dogs, pets, you know, uh, you know, neighbors coming up and looking at the window while you literally are on your interview. um, And they're they're at the window like this looking in um, and you're looking at them as they're looking at you. That kind of stuff just became commonplace. So I wonder if, uh, you know, you know, the numbers have kind of evened out across everything. But what I found interesting is that it said that a blurred background of your space, actually, people trust you less with that. Um, I, that that's well, kind of They, they like, want to know what you're hiding. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. hiding something. Yeah, I also yeah. think it's because of that particular thing is people use that built in uh, function for that and then it's never clean around the edges so it does yeah, really it look clips like out and stuff it gives the impression and this is different than having a slightly out of focus background because you got a super swank you know uh, <laughs> uh webcam or you're using a dslr for for a webcam in that it just looks like you didn't bother to clean up and this is the fastest way to make sure that people didn't see that I mean, okay, so I'm using, right, this is uh, StreamYard's, uh, this is StreamYard's built-in blur background. I've never used this before, so I know it looks kind of weird. Uh, but uh, I, I feel like I look like I'm on a roller coaster or perhaps yeah. merry-go-round well, and type and thing. And your right, and right side of your out. head is missing, yeah. like it's been cut <laughs> off. Yeah, we can't see. We- <laughs> yeah, well, I lost it. I'm going too fast. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I get why it's used. I don't know. This particular blur is a little bit strange. I've I've never done this before. We're doing it on the fly, but yeah, I guess I don't, it's, it's this seen doesn't as the bother low. me when I see it, it with other people. But I always sort of assume that they they either have something written on a whiteboard that is you know company secrets type thing, or they have a messy house. It's it feels and I don't more care like about either of those things, but mm-hmm. that's well, usually what I think. I think what's implied in that, and I, it's not that I agree with it, what's implied with that is the person is lazy or couldn't get their act together uh-huh. enough to, right. to get everything It's the together. easy way out type thing. Ex- and I and think therefore, it feeds into our like, subconscious of like, you know, we see someone, we judge them instantly because that's how our like monkey well, brain works. Watch, yeah. watch any cable news network when they bring in pundits to talk about whether it's like the conflict in Ukraine or political issues like the pro campaigning or financial issues, you'll notice that the people they talk to that they Skype in or whatever uh, from their homes, they always try to have like a bookcase of books or something. So they look somewhat. And the books that they wrote too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but somehow it feels like they're more learned or perhaps more accomplished uh, uh, education wise and therefore have a greater. Their, yeah. their, their voice I am a person who away. reads. Yeah, well, it's you like know, when I you see long. someone with glasses yeah. and you think that they're smarter because they have glasses. It's hey, just a I, I, that's true. I mean, <laughs> I mean so Roger back during has the pandemic, always looked very, very smart. And Rob as well. Yeah, back during the pandemic, glasses. I used an actual green screen. So I had like a, just a big green backdrop. Crazy. And I would actually, if I was doing a Zoom call, I would run it through OBS first where I could really chrome, you know, do a really fine, finely tuned chroma key. So you sometimes couldn't tell where I was. Um, It's like, dude, are you outside right now? Because like, I literally would have like a video (laughs) playing, you know, like a, like a 15 or 20 minute video on a loop playing where you could see people walking, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, in the background and stuff like that. And what I would always get, man, your microphone is ridiculous. I can't hear any of the background noise. And (laughs) yeah, I would say, you know, that, you know, that's just a video back there. (laughs) And they're like, what? So it would be when I would actually stand up and then go walk back. Um, or I have a, I had like a, like a, a green t-shirt and I would take the t-shirt and put it over my head and my face would disappear <laughs> type stuff. But people aren't generally doing that level of production. Yeah. So, you know, it, it saddens you me that, that it you know, elevates it. Yeah. It, it, it saddens me that people would actually think less of you if you weren't going out and running a whole other piece of software just to make yourself look better in a yeah. green scheme. And I think it's interesting that, I mean... We're very visual creatures. We it's just why you have so many facial expressions to display your discontent. <laughs> um, but like for example, if you had a bookcase and you were on some sort of uh, uh, roundtable about uh, uh, you know vegan issues, and 
all your books are about the joy of barbecuing and you know stuff it, it it would send the wrong signal and i think what people are trying to do is what they do in real life situations is they want to cultivate uh, a, a set of expectations or at least uh, a, a non a non vocal uh signpost that I'm 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 in law enforcement. Can't you see all these badges and all these other things behind me that yeah. indicate that I'm a mm-hmm. I'm in law enforcement yeah. or I'm a lawyer? My diploma's look at on all the wall. These, yeah, yeah, like look at all these degrees I got from these great you know universities. That's how you know I'm a good lawyer. Um, mm-hmm. You know, doctors do the same thing, and it's you know, I mean, if you go to a mechanic, you don't care because they have the car in the lift, and it's like, well, as long as you. You know, get my car working by the end of the week. You know, it doesn't. You I think we're probably also. Diploma on the wall. What? <laughs> Diplomas on walls, or I don't. I wish I knew where mine was. I didn't throw it out. My I diploma is European. It, is. it doesn't have any gold on it. I. It's very. It looks <laughs> it's like actually. Paper. It's, it's a cool diploma. You know, not, not a lot of bells and whistles. Just the facts. Oh, uh, American diplomas aren't framed. You got to frame it yourself. I, think I have it in my drawer. I should have. Oh yeah, no, I I framed it. I was. I, it used to be on my wall for many years. Um, then I don't know. I was like, mm, no one cares. I used. I almost. American thing, yeah. I almost framed my uh, Kentucky Colonel uh, little thing. Remember when that guy? Maybe maybe it was before you started, but he he got everyone on screensavers. Like he signed them up to be like uh, official Kentucky con- colonels, which is like basically an honorary uh, uh, signifier from the state of Kentucky. And the, what can you one. can you vote on things? Can you do nothing. anything with it's this? Nothing. No, it's it's what Colonel Sanders was. Okay, you know, from KFC, he was a Kentucky. Okay. That's where his. <laughs> you're was. not some sort of House of Representatives. You're fry cook. No, is what you, you are. <laughs> uh, I was I was the, just talking about um, uh, Zoom backgrounds or you know backgrounds in general. I think probably all of us are. We know enough about setting up. And what, you know, these sorts of broadcasts, like the one that we're doing right now, what it entails, you know, microphones, very important. You know, so many people just don't get More that important. audio is as important as it is. And it just has to mm-hmm. be for things like what we're doing, maybe for, you know, a, a quick, you know, weekly call with your remote team, not so much. But uh, I, I tend to forgive, I mean, unless it's somewhat bizarre you know like you were saying nikki like maybe there's like a dark basement where you're like hmm what's going on in there but besides besides that as long as i can hear you and you seem like you're doing okay great you know we're i don't care what your background looks like scott scott johnson was saying that he got pulled in for jury duty virtually and then he got excused because apparently they picked a bunch of people who had like good mics and good video and they excused them because it could have been that the case was about something to do with electronics and they're like oh these guys are like not on their phone like can't figure out how to launch the zoom so they're like too smart for this case or whatever so huh maybe yeah i mean that is maybe interesting yeah yeah i i think really what it shows is uh, the reason why the reason why books have such fancy covers on them is because a lot of people do judge a book by its cover. I mean, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, but, what, you know, what your first impressions versus what you do after when you think for a second is what makes all the difference, I think. Yeah, I don't really judge folks in Zooms just because I'm, I'm so used to doing it. It's just, yeah. it's just what you do. What still amazes me is that, I mean, and we are well out of the pandemic at this point, but what amazes me is that there are so many pundits who, it's not like they're on television once or twice a year, so maybe they don't have the right setup, but it's folks who are literally on every single day that are using the camera in their in, in their laptop, um, mm-hmm. or they don't have a good microphone. And I'm just like, you know, why didn't that channel actually get you to you know set up because it doesn't take a lot i mean even you, if right. it was you, twice a year i would i would get a webcam yeah. or something <laughs> like i said for those folks i forgive because it's like it might have been hey something happened we need to get you on right now just use your iphone just use your you know use your laptop you, you'll be fine but it's the folks who are literally on two three four five times a week or more on yeah. on different shows it's like okay you're on television you probably should have done a little bit to step your game up um, yeah, whether it be yeah. getting, you know, get a green a screen or something, something. but I th- something. I, I think s- at least some of those individuals I notice are in different locations. Uh, 
the the few times I, I've seen them. So I think they just might be traveling, or they're in, you know, they're, you they're constantly. You can do a good traveling uh-huh. setup. You can even do like a like a you know a clip mic, some. Mm-hmm. Maybe they just don't want to do it anymore. This is their passive yeah, way, maybe they passive don't aggressive way. <laughs> I'm not that. sure, but I um, I don't know. I think yeah, I I'm with you, Rob. It's like does does someone at the newsroom not have you know five ten minutes just to talk through you know some stuff? Then again. Can't tell you how many times I've tried to explain audio or even basic lighting to somebody, and they're like, "And I'm not saying that everyone needs to understand how this all works. Absolutely not. But uh, but it's pretty easy, you know, for me to say, here's what you do. You know, this is the mic you need. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, you know, we light yourself. Maybe there's a window. We can, you know, face the other way. And people just kind of go like, I, Can you not hear me? It's fine. Yeah, and you go, well, I'm sure, it's on. going to work, but it's not great. Um, it's hard to make somebody care about stuff like that. If I they promise don't. next time I'm on, I'll put up curtains. <laughs> I, mean, this, I like um, your background. No, but I've I mean, got the at, sun setting in my face. Oh, oh, oh. Well, no, but, but, but no this, it, looks, it looks healthy. Vitamin D. Dramatic. Yeah, this, is the argument. this is the argument for the use case of uh, uh, virtual use, like a, a virtual copy of you that you could use whatever the instance might be. It might be, it Creating could even embryo. be your voice, but it would just be like, hey, it's the best looking version of me. Like I'm on CNN. So let me call up the CNN avatar of me and I don't have to figure out what my room looks like or just have a decent mic. I can be in like, you know, my pajamas, my hair's all messed up and, you know, I got a a, cu- a cup of coffee that's filled with like vodka or something and I'd be drinking it. <laughs> but they wouldn't tell because they, you have this nice CGI version so you're of like you. Deep fake Roger. Yeah, it would be great, right? Wouldn't you? If you had that option and you like had to be on a call, like a, a like a conference, vi- you know, a, a video conference call, like you could just set that up and like, you know, to, um, you'd be Canada yelling, Valley. you could be yelling from the, uh, on the top of, you know, the toilet, you know? And just like, yeah, you know, it's a good idea. We should put that on hold for 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 next week's meeting. You know, maybe we should move on to uh, 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 you know our um, you know finances or whatever. I mean, I mean, I think that's where those things will go because maybe I I believe there will be a future that will that will be integrated into a video conference uh, web tools like Streamyard and Zoom that will automatically just virtually insert or remove things for you. So you don't have to do anything. You press a button and it makes you look nice. I did see that Zoom now uses an AI feature to track your conversations and then sends you a like summary of it after by email. Um, you talked a lot about barbecue today. Have you thought about ordering some barbecue from the local barbecue <laughs> store? I don't know. It's it's weird. I think I think a lot of it is um, we've we've trained over the decades, perhaps centuries. That certain appearances carry more weight uh, in terms of authority uh, than others, mm-hmm. or even um, identifying your your like safe group. Like you know, I'm thinking like caveman thought like stranger is bad, and like that's why we have prejudices. It's because like it's a hardwired safety mechanism. Not that you know now we're smart enough to be over it. Well, some people are, but I mean the idea is to recognize when when that. When, when that uh, when that prejudice that filter kicks in, uh, yeah. and why you're reacting in the way you do, right? Like it, yeah, it's weird because a lot of it is is sort of instinctual. When you see a big, large animal with sharp teeth, kind of making loud, rumbling noises, you generally like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be in its space and I should back up a little bit. Um, but a lot of the stuff when it comes to just social interactions are are taught behavior. Right, not directly, but like you just learn through yeah, you learn through other true. people's interactions, right? Like and just societal expectations. I I remember we had this discussion in uh, in, in in my university at SF State uh, when we were talking about like the whole uh, uh, the whole ca- kind of uh, um, stereotype that Asians are bad drivers, and I and there were two students, myself and another Asian student. We brought up, um, she said, "Yeah, we're really bad drivers," and I said, "I think it's because it's cultural." Right, because driving wasn't a thing in Asia until like like personal automobile ownership wasn't a thing until the late to mid '60s. Right, for a lot of the population, only people who had cars were well off, um, and so 
in the U.S., for example, you have so many cues of what's considered good and bad driving, not just from your parents or your relatives, from movies, TV shows, right? Mm. We know when we watch a comedy movie about someone who's in a, you know, in, a, in, a, in a driving class and they're like just turning the wheel like this and they're all over the road, they're bad, you know, they don't pay attention. We have all these cues, but if a society doesn't build those up uh, or have those, you don't learn it in the same way, which is why I'm glad that they added like some of these could just be cultural cues like, OK, I grew up yeah. in a society where bookshelves, bookcases were a signifier of authority in a different society. It might be something else. It might be like, oh, you know, this person's a great weaver or an artist. They carry great weight or they're just old. And so, you know, we give respect to, to elderly people because they've been around and ideally should know a little bit more than we do. I mean, Sarah, yeah. you're having way too much fun with those filters. <laughs> yeah, you have. Uh, is the, you get that's it now. a scat. This is. No scat. I don't know wh whose car this is. This is something that's I found a on my computer. That's, that's either a Dodge or a Plymouth. <laughs> is it, uh, uh, this is not a car I've seen in real life. I don't know where this is. Oh, but I've I was seen like, my friend. Had, I I wrote tree, and this image came up on. My yeah, car don't you see the system. tree on this? On the side of it? Yeah, I guess I somehow saved it for some weird reason in the year 2020. That's what the file board. says. Um, Although it's, cool it's I don't know. It's, yeah, it has the mine. vinyl top, though. If they went with the straight I mean, top, it's a purple, better. I don't know what. Something. It's a Dodge Swinger or okay. a, a Plymouth See? or pl All right. or a Dodge Dart. I'm also, um, I've been told that I'm an extremely bad driver. <laughs> <laughs> don't know what that says about me. Um, I, think I am kind of a bad driver. Thing also about driving. I was thinking about that because it also people say all the time that women are bad drivers, and I this happened to me where like I have a brother and he's apparently better driver than me. But also my dad took him driving when he was fourteen, but didn't ask me to go driving when I was fourteen because like boys do car things and like yeah, no wonder women are mm -hmm. worse drivers because they don't get introduced to driving earlier. Like you're doing this yourself. Yeah. I mean, my dad was definitely taking me driving at age 14 because I had to learn stick. Um, but, you know, then I I still know how to drive manual shift. So, I mean, it worked. I don't know why I'm a bad driver. <laughs> I don't know if it's because of a woman or what. I mean, uh, and also what people consider to be bad driving is a little different. I noticed that people... Well, exactly. On, I've, I've had, I've had Coast, passengers often male who say mm, you're not a good driver so i mean there's a phrase when when i was driving up from new jersey up to uh, uh massachusetts when you cross like the three the three states in the three state area you'll notice specific license plates have certain driving behaviors that are very distinct from the yeah. neighboring state and uh you know there, there's a reason why massachusetts drivers have the nickname they do um and uh it was it, i think you know it, it's 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 very dependent. Like some places, you know, you don't go, f you don't need to go ten miles faster than the posted speed limit because then you're just a lead foot, right? And other places, well, you know, if you're well, it's it's you you also get uh, you know this is just a stereotype I hear a lot. Uh, people who, especially people who have never lived in L.A. or I guess California in general, who go, it'll rain once and no one in L.A. knows how to drive anymore. And it's like, yeah, they do. I mean. Maybe some people get thrown off by a little rain, but for the most part, people know how to drive. Yeah, I don't know why why people say that. It's like you could say that about lots of places where it doesn't yeah, rain that when much. It snows in the south, and when it's you know, yeah, right. I'm like, I think feel like the world still spins fairly normally. You know, I don't. Know. I I, mean, I, I, am, every, I am. Every state is like we have the worst drivers. <laughs> it's just everywhere. <laughs> When right, automated yeah. <laughs> driving, when automated cars become the majority of vehicle, personal vehicles on the road, I think it's going to boil down to, well, people in that state set their car to drive like this, but here in our state, <laughs> we set it to be like this. I just want it to be uh -huh. all trains, then we wouldn't have any of these problems. Team trains. Ah, you know what? Know. I'm with you on Train that. Train people. Yeah. 
Let's let's make some underground uh, point A's to point B and get her done. Overground. I want to see the views. Are you kidding me? I want to across America, see the Rockies. It would be incredible. You can. You just get on the train. Yeah. It just takes if a little bit got, longer. Like, four it's just the one Amtrak that's like really expensive and hard to book. I mean, you never I said about time. You just said trains. <laughs> Quickly. I want a bullet train. I want the shink. Oh, oh, American. Miss L- Miss Leadfoot here with the lead train, <laughs> Leadfoot train. <laughs> lead train. <laughs> so I recently just, watched. It's my dad's fault. Yeah. <laughs> I recently watched the uh, movie uh, I Robot again, and I remember hmm. the part where uh, Will Smith was on the motorcycle, and I can't remember the the, the actress's name, but she said, "Isn't this dangerous? It has gas. Hmm. Um, you know, like uh, a combustible uh-huh. liquid in you know in the tank." And I wonder how far we are away from that to where, you know, is it is it 20 years from now when there will be, you know, younger people who have never known anything but EVs. You actually used to drive around with like gasoline in the tank, (laughs) just like right in the back of the car where if you got hit, it could, you know, you know, your, your whole car could blow up. And it's like clearly that doesn't generally happen. They've designed it so that that does not happen is, you know, you know, is, is, is often as we can make it not happen. But I just wonder how close we are to that, to where people just don't even comprehend how we used to drive with gas or how we used to actually drive and not let the cars just do it for us. It's probably because gas is so expensive. But I, I every time I'm filling up my own gas tank, uh, you know, I have to do regularly. Um, I, I think like when, at what point will this all seem like a crazy thing that the old people used to do? You know, we, yeah, and there'd be one on every corner, sometimes four on each corner. Yeah. No, you know, and you no, just pick what? one and then you sit there for a minute and you fill up your car or you can't drive. I'm pretty sure my if my kids have kids. Uh, grandkids will be of the generations like you actually drove yourself what were you crazy like we're mm-hmm. fine with people other people or autopilots flying the plane we sit in because we generally know statistically it's pretty safe but you're risking your load life in your own hands with other people who are doing the same thing and you just and you managed to <laughs> uh. While doing that. wait and then you yeah. operated an like handheld electronic device splitting your attention Away from both uh, navigating the vehicle, and yeah, like almost like hand, like the era before seat belts frame. were law. Like, what? So yeah. people would just like choose not to sometimes. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I I remember as a kid. To be thrown clear. <laughs> I, I was I was dancing around in the backseat of my parents' car when I was a kid. It's like yeah, I could. I was in the back of the pickup and and told to oh, yeah. hold on. Hold on. I mean, nothing Sarah. bad ever People happened, but it was like I wasn't campus. like strapped down or anything. I was just, just kind of, you know. People still. My do dad that would say, now. "Don't stand up or anything. Yeah. That's dangerous." By the way. Oh yeah. I don't think no. we're twenty years out though. I think we're like maybe forty because, like, I know the government's like incentivizing EVs and all that, but like by the time it has to be so that poor people can afford it, and then it'll be everybody. Well, but I honestly think there will be a. a, a, a a paradigm. I love this word paradigm shift paradigm and the shift. way we use and we use vehicles where it will be more of a you just buy the time you, like car sharing, except they're, you know, instead of owning the the, the actual the car, you just like, well, <laughs> it would be more of a subscription model. You pay for a month yeah. and you get and you don't have and this is a great thing. You wouldn't have to settle on one model. You would just get whatever suits you. It's like, oh, I'm moving. So I need a pickup or a van. Oh, I just need to go to the store. I'm going on vacation. Give me, you know, a drop top two seater. That doesn't incentivize people to buy more cars. I well, that's the uh, whole idea is that people that. wouldn't buy, yeah, the car. They would subscribe but the to car the service. Car manufacturers would be pissed about that. No, no, because they would get in on it. They would be well, the like ones, smart. you know. Well, and that's the whole idea. There would be, a, uh, there would be, a, there would have to be a top to bottom shift. But I mean, you know, there's a reason why. You don't really see a lot of Ocano boxes as an entry-level model for a lot of uh, car makers, right? Ford dropped cars. I think Chevy will be uh, in a few years. Um, you know, Isuzu, a bunch of others have because the money's in all the SUVs and like you know the pickup trucks, yeah. and that's why they're all like forty, fifty thousand um, dollars. But not everyone can afford that. I mean, Those I cars can't. Cars are so gigantic. They're they're there to hold the big dreams that Americans have. 
<laughs> or big dreams or sob stories, depending. Um, a little of both. But, uh, eh, you know. <laughs> uh, you have big dreams that turn You into got big dreams stories. or you got big woes. You need something to carry them home with. Yep, something like that. <laughs> Good to, right. yeah. Big trunk in your car. I don't know. Uh, well, I think that just about does it for GDI today. Uh, Dr. Nikki, it's so good to have you on the show. Always a pleasure. I love being here. Well, we I love having you. Back next month. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I would like to give a shout out to everyone in the Twitch chat that has been supporting us over the show yeah. through the show. Zoe brings bacon and Rabbit Forty One for cheering us on with fits and Prince of Brow. And nine new for resubscribing uh, with uh, Amazon Prime. Thank you very much. Also, over, yes, thank you very much. Over on the Patreon side, uh, we noticed that Ross gave us a raise. Thank you, Ross. Thank uh, you. I haven't, ha- haven't really had a, a lot of visibility on Patreon raises, but uh, I think we're getting back to normalcy. So, um, so everybody who supports us, thank you so much. Um, whether, you, uh, whether you raise or could do so, in El Futuro, we appreciate all of you very much. Until tomorrow, folks, have a good day. Good day, good day.